days. Uh, before I begin my sermon, I want to just echo how excited we are for next week and Pastor Joanne preaching here. So I thought I, I thought I would go preach and teach the kids. I'm excited about that. It's been, it's been a long time since I was a children's pastor. I'm excited to go bless the children. Amen. And so we're in a series today called The Director's Cut. If you haven't been here talking about what is the God, the director's idea for the film of our lives. And I want to talk to you today for award, about awards in heaven. So the Motion Picture Academy gives Academy Awards or Oscars to directors and actors and various pictures, different parts of the films. And they want to award people for what they think is exceptional filmmaking. But did you know there's awards in heaven? I'm not, I'm not talking about salvation. We'll talk about that in a second. But I'm talking about God gives awards in heaven. So today we're going to look at what our heavenly director would award in heaven. Let's pray. We're going to ask God's help. Father, I just thank you for your presence here. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the cross and the empty tomb that you came took our sin, took our punishment, you died and were resurrected that we might have eternal life. But Lord, as we look at heaven today and we learn about awards in heaven, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and you would correct us where we need to be corrected, you would encourage us where we're discouraged, and you would empower us to become all you've called us to be. Be glorified in everything we'd say and do. I pray you'd hide my flesh behind your cross that you could speak to your people in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. I'm a little excited about this. I'm just saying, like, this is, this is one of those sermons where I'm like, I don't know how many believers really know this. And, and, and I get a little excited about this. But let me start back with the Academy Awards so you can get an understanding of what we're talking about. So the Academy Awards first began in 1929. And here's the exciting thing about this. Think about this for a minute. The first Academy Award presentation cost five bucks to get in the door. Even if you say inflation, it's only like $70 today. There was only 270 people present, and the whole thing took 15 minutes. Have you ever seen those four-hour, five-hour Academy Award shows? That isn't even the whole show. That's just what they broadcast. This celebration of self, it's crazy. 15 minutes was the first show. But here's what I want you to know today. The man that invented these awards was named Louis B. Meyer. He owned the biggest film production company at the time. And they asked him at one point why he invented the Academy Awards. And this is what he said. I want to read it so I get it right. The best way to handle filmmakers is to hang medals all over them. I got them cups and awards so that they would kill themselves to produce the kind of film I wanted. That's why the Academy Awards were created. So the whole idea of this award was to manipulate, is to, to cause them to do what he wanted. Sometimes the awards that we get, whether it's an employee of the month or uh, an academic award or, or something like this, it's, it's to cause us to give the behavior that the person that's supervising us wants. Your boss gives an, you know, this is the employee of the month because this is the way I want you all to behave. Or, hey, you're going to be on the honor roll in school because this is the goal is to, to get a certain grade average. And, and all of these awards in our planet seem to be very manipulative. But see, God's not like that. He doesn't give to manipulate. God gives to bless and to encourage, amen? So what kind of a life does God reward? Our series scripture, hopefully those of you that call House of Praise home have memorized it by now. It's from Psalm 119. Let's actually say it together on a count of three. One, two, three. I pondered the direction of my life and I turned to follow your laws. So David is saying, I realized somewhere I got off track. You know, David was a follower of God, but he said, at some point I got away from your laws and I turned and came back to your laws. See, because to gain God's awards in heaven, we need to follow his directions, his law here on earth. But the first thing you need to know is this. Point number one today is this. 
Heaven is not an award. I, I want to just stay here for a minute because I came out of a denomination that taught the opposite of this. Heaven is not an award for good deeds. It's not an award for the one with the most faith. It's not an award for being part of a church. You come to this church because there's fantastic preaching and I'm really good looking. But this doesn't get you into heaven. You could sit in these seats or turn it online and still go to hell, unfortunately. So if, if heaven is not an award for being a good person, we're going to have to talk about what it is. But let me prove it to you. From Ephesians chapter 2, it says this. God saved you by his grace. So the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. He's writing to people that are in a church like you are. And he says, God saved you by his grace. When? When you believed. So you can't take credit for it. It's a free gift. The word grace literally means unearned favor. You can't earn salvation. So we got to understand this clearly. That I'm not, when I'm talking the rest of this sermon about awards in heaven, I'm not talking about getting in. I'm talking about once you're there. Amen? So if you think about the Academy Awards, somebody can be an actor and never get an award, but they're still an actor. You can be a Christian. You're going to heaven. I'm talking about what's it like after? What's it like once we're there? Your, your heavenly home is already settled if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But heaven is never an award for what you do. Let me, let me prove it to you one more scripture on that, Romans, Romans chapter 3. Because this is so important, because I don't want anybody to believe that if I'm a good person, I go to heaven. Or if I do certain works, I'm, I, it's not like that. God doesn't keep a ledger and like, okay, these are the good things, these are the bad things. Does it balance? Does it balance? Oh, he's just a little on the wrong side down. You, you're going to walk up to the gates, and he's going to go, what did you do with my son? It's my Lord and Savior. I've trusted him for everything. Okay, come on in. Romans chapter 3 says, can we boast? Can we boast that we're saved? Can we boast that we've done anything to be accepted? See, that's what the Pharisees did. Well, you know, we do acts of mercy and we've memorized scripture and, you know, I went to theology school and none of that saves you. Even good things don't save you. Even showing kindness to others, even praying, it doesn't save you. The only thing that saves you is belief in Jesus Christ. He said, no, because our acquittal, I love that term, it means you're, you're in court and they say not guilty. It's not by obeying the law. It's based on faith. What do you mean? I believe Jesus Christ died, taking all my sins, rose again, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. I ask him to forgive me and I accept my salvation on that basis. We're made right with God through faith, not obeying the law. So, when I talk about awards today, get it out of your head that heaven is an award for good deeds. It is not. It's a free gift of grace. We good there? No, no controversy on this fact? But then I started to think about what happens in heaven, and you know, in our society, we're so motivated by awards. We compete for trophies and achievements. As I said, employee awards, sports awards, civic awards, and, and even in education, you know, whether you're on a, a dean's list or this, or, or when you get a doctorate, you're awarded the doctorate, right? It's to prove you've reached a certain level of education. But thinking about heavenly awards, what does, what does God award? I think before we could understand that, we needed to understand that we're not talking about getting to heaven. But we can get a little picture of it when we look first at what God awards here on earth. So let's, let's start by looking at what God awards here on earth. So God rewards, and you know, as we're talking about awards today, I'm going to talk from scripture about what he rewards. Amen. Because we're, we're using awards because we're in a movie theme. But what God rewards, the life he rewards, is faith. And diligently seeking him. So when we look at this earth, God blesses, he rewards, he gives an award to those who have faith and diligently seek him. If you look at the faith chapter in Hebrews 11, it's a list of God's hall of fame. By faith, Moah, by, by Noah. I got Moses and Noah together, Moah. By faith, Moses. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, the whole chapter is God's hall of fame. Here's my all-star lineup. 
But see, in the middle of it, in, in verse 6, it says it is impossible to please God without faith. What does that mean, Pastor? You know, the Bible's not as hard as you think it is. It interprets itself. Just keep reading. If you're plucking individual scriptures out, you're, you're going to get very confused. But if you read things in the context of when they were written and what they're talking about, it makes sense. So he, he says it's impossible to please God without faith. What do you mean? Anyone who comes to him must first believe that he exists. You ever talk to somebody and you go, I don't believe in God. I've had this experience. I don't believe in God. How can we, how can we don't believe in God? Well, I prayed once and nothing happened. I go, how'd you pray? I said, hey, if you're real, save my marriage. And I'm like, well, let me show you Hebrews 11.6. First, you've got to kind of believe he's real. Otherwise, you might as well pray to the Easter Bunny. Okay. So first, you've got to believe he's real, and then you come with him with this understanding, this faith. Not of what you see. But faith that the Bible's true, faith that he'll do what he says he will do. Faith in what? That God exists and he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Another version says diligently seek him. See, God knows your heart. Like he, he understands whether you're sincere or you're just in it for you. He understands if you're giving him your best or you're giving him your leftovers. Yeah, I got two minutes before the news. I can pray. Come on. He rewards. He gives an award to those who diligently seek him. Now, the reward can be a greater blessing here on earth. It can, the reward could be peace. But we know he blesses us here on earth, right? He awards certain things. If you want to, in your Bibles, open up to Psalm 91, you'll see uh, David talking a picture of a life that God awards. And he begins to say, Lord, you said this. He begins to prophesy the way the Lord would speak to us. He says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. So he's saying, if you, if you trust me, if you have faith in me, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to rescue you. When you call upon me, I will answer. I will be with them that are in trouble. You're, you're never alone. See, he rewards us here on earth for faith and diligently seeking him. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life, and I'll give them my salvation. Now, you've got to remember this is a psalm in the Old Testament. He's not actually talking about the salvation through Christ. He's saying, if you look at that word, it means to rescue from a trap. I'll save them from whatever they're going through. Amen? You're like, well, I don't know. I love the Lord, and I've been praying. I'm going through a lot. He doesn't say when, just says he will. And so you have to have faith that he will be there the way he said. Protection, honor, a long life, rescue. These are rewards here on earth. Let me give you another one, Philippians chapter 4. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul writing to a church he planted. He said, I love you and I long to see you, my dear friends. You hear his heart in the middle of it. And he says, you're my joy. Wait, wait. And the crown I receive from my work. Was Paul crowned here in the earth? No, he ended his life in, on house arrest. Had an ankle bracelet on everything. That was a joke, sorry. He says, those that we pour our heart into here on earth will be a crown for us in heaven. A crown in heaven, Pastor Lon? Yeah. Well, well Jesus has is a, is a, got a crown in heaven. We're going to have crowns in heaven. It says that the elders take off their crowns and lay them at his feet. Where'd they get the crowns? There's an award in heaven. God gives awards in heaven. Have you ever heard this? Isn't this crazy? God gives awards in heaven. Who said that? Jesus. <laughs> Luke chapter 6. He says, for great is your reward in heaven. Now, never, I don't even want to talk about the context here, but I want you to say, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. What? There's greater rewards in heaven? 
He, he's looking at them and he's saying, great is your reward in heaven when? And he tells them all the different circumstances. But I want you to focus on that for a second. Wait, so if there's some that get a great reward, there's some that don't? I didn't even know there was rewards in heaven. See, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and, and he's talking to his disciples. And he's talking to all these people that have studied the Old Testament. And with these seven little words, he just blows their mind. For great is your reward in heaven. He's not talking about getting in. He's talking about what happens once you're there. There's a reward. There's, there's great rewards. Everybody's like, what? I don't understand. Jesus talked a lot about this. In, in his famous passage, the Sermon on the Mount, which is in, in Matthew and it goes on for several chapters, but right in the middle of it, in Matthew 6, 18, he stops and he begins teaching about the difference between the way people live that won't be rewarded and the way people do. So he begins talking at one point about fasting, and he has this assumption when you fast and pray, but he tells them how to do it to get a reward. He says, wash your face. He must, must have been talking to some teenage girls, I'm just saying. Wash your face. Teenage boys don't wash your face. That's why I said girls. What is he saying? Don't do it for show. Don't fast and pray like, oh, coming in all disheveled so that everybody knows you're a mess. And He says, do it so no one will know that you're fasting except your father who knows everything you do in private. But wait, he sees everything and he will reward you. Then he goes on and he, he begins talking about money. So if you look at that first verse about the fasting and prayer, and you say, well, yeah, he'll reward you here on earth. Well, what do you do with the next verse? He says, don't store up treasure here on earth. Where moths eat it and rust destroys it and where thieves break out. Store your treasures in heaven. What? They can't be stolen there. They don't get destroyed there. There's eternal treasures. So he's talking in this sermon on the mount, the greatest sermon many people believe Jesus ever did. And he's saying there's stuff that you can get in heaven. Store it up in heaven. And I stop and I'm like, Lord, I don't understand. I thought heaven was the reward. Heaven is not a reward for the good things we do. Whoa. Jesus paid the ticket for heaven. It's like you got an all-expense paid trip to Bermuda. The ticket's paid for. The room is there. He's creating a mansion for you. But, like, you want some excursions? You, you want the free buffet? You know, you, this, these are rewards once you get there. They're extra. I know, I know, I know. This is kind of, some of you are like, I can see people like, you're getting into a doctrine of works. No, I'm not. You can't earn heaven. But Jesus is saying, once you get there, some will have a great reward. Some will have treasures. And he's saying to them, store up treasures in heaven. Meaning some don't. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've been saved 20 years. I've never heard this stuff. Mm, they'd never heard it either. In Luke chapter 6, he says it this way. What blessing awaits you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you is evil because you follow the Son of Man. We kind of live in a society like that today. You intolerant, ugly thing. I'm not saying I don't love you. I'm saying this is what the Bible says. Your argument's with him, not me. You asked me what I believe. I told you what I believe, and suddenly I'm a hate monger. Blessed are you when people mock you and, and exclude you. They won't eat lunch with me, Pastor. It's okay. Treasures in heaven and curse you 
You know, the thing is, we don't really even have persecution here. I mean, I've, I, I've talked to different people. I remember talking to, to one woman who is from Indonesia, and she said, I, you know, I was like, oh, I know that's a, a place where Christians are persecuted. I've, I've read about different people being martyred and drugged off. And, and I said, were you ever persecuted? And she said, no, God protected us. And I'm going to tell you the truth, I was a little disappointed because I wanted to hear some stuff. And she's like, we were just like protected in like a bubble, her words, not mine. She said, we've seen persecution. We've seen, like, our neighbor had, had their arm chopped off when the machete gangs came through and her husband was killed in front of her eyes. I've seen persecution for being Christians. She goes, my, my husband lost his job three times, but we were never persecuted. They fired him when they found out he was a Christian, but God protected us and provided for us. What? Our house was burned down. But we were never persecuted. What a different perspective than us that are like, I invited my neighbor to church, now they won't barbecue with me. I'm being persecuted for Jesus. <laughs> they didn't give me that promotion because they said I'm lazy. I'm being persecuted for Jesus. <laughs> Back to the point of this sermon, there's rewards, there's an award in heaven for those that are serving the Lord. And you say, well, you know, blessing awaits you. He could be talking about here. That, that, see, this is the beauty of scripture. When you read Matthew 6 and you see the Sermon on the Mount, you think, is he talking about here? And then the next verse, he goes, no, no, this is heaven. The next verse is here in, in, in 22, 23, he says, when that happens, leap for joy. When they revile you. When they persecute you. Woo! This is awesome! The kingdom is the opposite of the way the world works. We rejoice when things are good. God says rejoice when you're persecuted for my name's sake. I'm not talking about being persecuted because you're doing something wrong. I'm talking about when they hate you just because of whom you serve. Leap for joy. You know, when Paul and Silas were beaten with rods and thrown into prison, they began to rejoice. They were like, wow, we were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. I'm like, dude, here's a number for a mental health counselor. Like, what is going on with you? It just doesn't make sense to us, right? This is not the way our natural mind works. But this is what Jesus was teaching. He's like, you don't understand because you're getting rewards in heaven. Little temporary suffering here on earth gives you eternal crowns. It's worth it, is what he's saying. It's worth it. Anything you lose here is worth it, because you gain so much greater there. Be happy. Leap for joy. Why? For a great award awaits you in heaven. Remember, they did the same thing to the ancient prophets. Wow. Listen, I... I don't, whatever your source of suffering is, whether it's persecution or sickness or loss or whatever your source of suffering is, understand that Jesus captures every tear in a bottle, says the scripture. I don't understand how that works. must be a big bottle. But I'm just saying that he's not uncaring. He's not callous and unmoved by our suffering. When he came to the tomb of Lazarus, he wept, even though he knew he was about to raise Lazarus. Why? He wept at the grief of his friends. He wept for what Lazarus went through physically. He was moved with compassion, and then he still did a miracle. So what I'm saying is, I'm not mocking your suffering. I'm not saying God doesn't care about your suffering. What I'm saying is, rejoice when you're persecuted for him because you're getting rewards in heaven. We have rewards in heaven Great rewards in heaven. He said great rewards await you. So that means there can be not so great awards if we take the contrary to that. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 gives us, you know, an idea of how to do things here on earth to get there. He says, you know, whatever you're doing, work willingly at it. Why? As though you're working for the Lord and not for people. I'm going to stop there for a minute. I'm going to tell you, I'm trying not to get misty. Every time I read this scripture, 
I think of a longtime church member here, Deacon Paul Lovelace. Because I remember one time standing in that back parking lot, and he, you know, he, for those of you who knew him, he was always so faithful to work so hard. And I remember saying to him, he had, he had done a personal favor for me, something I had asked him to do in the building. I shook his hand. I said, thank you for doing that for me. And he goes, Pastor, I love you. But I didn't do it for you. I'm serving the Lord with my gifts. And that, that lesson from that man of God taught me He's working for the Lord. Now, he, he loved me and he would do anything for me. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying he worked at whatever his hands could do because he's like, I'm not maybe going to preach and I'm not maybe going to prophesy, but I'm going to find whatever my hands can do because I'm working for Jesus. Amen? Now look at what happens. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. Come on now. Now, yes, there's inheritances. His, his daughter is here. His, he's got grandkids serving the Lord. He's got, you know, all kinds of things. There's an inheritance here. But I truly believe there's an inheritance waiting in heaven. Amen? Remember the master you're serving is Christ. We're not doing it to impress people. If you go through that Beatitudes, everything Jesus is saying is like, don't let anybody know. Don't let anybody know. Don't let anybody know. Because there's rewards in heaven. Nowadays, people, you know, they want to show off when they're doing something. They, they, they want an award here on earth. And I'm like, well, there's your award. Have, take that uh, gold-painted cup home. Enjoy. I'll, I'll take mine there. Amen? All right, I got to move on for a minute. But, you know, this week went to a funeral of somebody who had mentored us. I'm a little nostalgic. So none of you here know her. But Joanne Cervello is her name. My pastor, Mike Cervello, it's his mom. And Joanne mentored me in many ways, but that's not what I want to draw your attention to. I want you to understand the church we came from was it's now called Redeemer. It was called Mount Zion back in the day. It started with her on her porch praying. A pastor named Nick Welsh in Illion, New York, came by, and he had read that her daughter had had a mental break. Now, her daughter was at a party, and doctors think somebody slipped her LSD, and she had a complete psychic break, psychotic break, and was in an institution. He said, can I go pray for your daughter? And he went faithfully praying for her for weeks, and suddenly she was healed. So she's on her porch praying. He comes in response to that. She accepts Christ. She, in her living room, says, I'm going to do a Bible study with a couple of ladies from the neighborhood. From that, a man named Steve Fidel gets saved. He, he goes and he establishes his church, Rock Solid Church in uh, Whitesboro, New York. From that, a woman named Barb Cervello gets saved, her daughter-in-law. They begin working on her son, Michael. He gets saved. He was my pastor out there for many, many years. From that church, there's been countless people saved equipped, encouraged. I was sent out of that church. Cliff Cool, who's a, a half hour from us, he was sent out of that church. Many pastors were sent out of that church. So think about the people that were saved here, saved there, saved in other churches. Think about the people that are discipled through this. All of that is because of one woman praying on her porch. And I think this week, she actually died a week ago today, she went into heaven to a great reward. Because she's like, I don't, I don't know what I can do, but I can get a couple women over the house. We can study the Bible together. Who knew that all these churches would be birthed out of that Bible study in her room? Nothing you do for the Lord is little. It just seems little now. I'm sure she is shocked in heaven today knowing all the people that her life influenced that she never met. Come on now. Great rewards in heaven. So it brings me to my next point, which is this. Did you know you can lose your rewards in heaven? What? I'm not talking about salvation. We can lose our rewards in heaven. Let me prove it to you. First John 1 John 1.8. Watch out that you do not lose what you've worked so hard to achieve. 
Be diligent that you receive your full reward. And some people have wrongly put this towards salvation. It's not what it's talking about. He's saying, watch out that you don't lose your rewards in heaven. Because remember, he rewards faithfulness and diligence. He's saying, don't, don't start out on fire and end up at the end just coasting. You could lose what you've stored up. Wait, we can, we can lose the treasures we stored up in heaven? I'm like, well, this is, this is what it's saying. It's saying it implies you could have a partial reward. In other words, your reward was supposed to be bigger. But something happens. Now, you know, to be clear, we're all, we're all going to be in heaven. We're all going to love it. I don't know what the rewards are. I don't know if you get a closer seat to the throne in the worship. I have no idea. You know, I just know this, that Jesus taught, and it's very cl clear that the apostles all taught and believed that there are different awards, rewards, levels in heaven. Amen? So this can't be speaking of salvation. When you, when you look at 1 Corinthians 3, we're going to go there for a little bit. 1 Corinthians 3 talks about, Paul is talking about the foundation of the church, and, and he's saying the foundation that we lay, you can't lay any other one but Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We build on the rock. The foundation is the rock. Salvation is of the rock. There's, no, there's nothing else about that. Anyone who builds on that, however, can build with different materials. Gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay. Some translations say stubble. Well, if we all have the same foundation, then what is he talking about? Rewards here on earth. Read the next verse. On judgment day, the fire will reveal what you built with. Each builder is going to go through the fire, and the fire will show if the person's work had any value. Is it gold? Is it silver? Is it jewels? Things that will survive the fire? Is it wood? It looks good. It looks strong, but it's religion. Is it hay? Is it straw? Is it things that are temporary and weak that we give our time and our life to, like money or fame or just stupidity? On judgment, the fire will reveal. We're talking about what we can take to heaven with us, the awards that will be in heaven. But on judgment day, the next verse says, the fire will reveal the kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives... That builder will receive a reward. They're already in heaven. He's talking about the rewards that we get for what we've done for the Lord. Amen. Not salvation. Continue in the next verse. It says, but the work, but the work is burned up. The builder may suffer great loss. You can lose what you've built, but the builder's saved. See, if you got Jesus, you're fireproof, okay? Someone barely escaping the walls of flame. See, this is a picture of a saved person entering heaven. And the greatest award we can hear in heaven is well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. But beyond that, there are awards in heaven. Before you can get awarded in heaven, you've got to make sure you're going there. So you have the foundation of the rock. We're going to pray a prayer in a second, and if you've never turned over control of your life to Jesus, we're going to do that. But most of us are believers here. If I've been talking and you're like, man, I don't know if what I'm building is bringing awards in heaven. What am I giving my life, my time to? It could be a moment that you want to repent and ask God to cleanse you and give you right direction. Amen? So we're all going to pray this prayer. If you've never turned your life over to Jesus Christ, this is your moment. If you're watching a House of Praise Worldwide, say it with me. Say, Dear Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I've built on the wrong things. I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse me in your precious blood. That I would be with you in heaven. And I ask that you would give me diligence and faithfulness that I could build rewards in heaven by serving you here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to tell me. Online, you could do this on your digital connect card. Here in the room, there's a checkbox on the back of this that says, Today I've decided to follow Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It's important you let us know this. You know, over, over 40 people did this last year. Is that right? 40 people. We pray for each and every one. There's a place for prayer requests in the bottom if you want us to pray specifically for you. But it's important that you tell somebody, amen? And if you'll give me your contact information, whether here or online, I'm going to send you a free book called My Next Step. I'm a follower of Jesus. Now what? It's going to help you know what your next steps in following Christ are, amen? Listen, speaking of next steps, I want to challenge you this week to share your faith with somebody. See, because there's more scriptures about go and tell, the Great Commission, all these things that we don't obey. I think we're robbing ourselves of reward in heaven, even if that reward is just knowing that person you talk to is there, like I talked about with Joanne Cervello. Invite someone, so any woman, next week. I'm excited. Pastor Joanne rocks the house. I get to talk to the kids. But women are going to be honored and pampered. You know, we live in a society that doesn't always honor women. And so we want to do that tomorrow. Amen. And so now I'm going to turn it over for Barry to come up and do the tithes and offerings. Listen, don't tune out online. The sermon is not over. He's going to preach at you now and let you know about serving Jesus. God bless you. Hello, hello. Our uh, tithe and offering verses are from Mark 12, 41 through Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came in and dropped two small coins. First off here, what we see is we see that Jesus is observing what's going on. He's, he's caring for that. He's, he's, he's not just... Um, you know, just there to pass the time of day. He's actually looking, and he looks at this woman. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who make, are making contributions. And the disciples are probably like, okay. Um, but one of the things that Jesus did is he saw with the eyes of the Father. So what was the father looking at? Now, he wasn't, you know, dismissing what the others had put in. But this, this was special. This was special. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. One of the things that's very interesting is in 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about, if I give everything I have to the doesn't profit me. When Jesus looked at that woman, he saw more than the two coins. He saw more than that she was a widow. What he saw was a heart that trusted, that knew that, you know, I don't know where my next meal may come from or whatever, but I know it's coming, and I don't have to depend on these two mites to get me my next meal. So when the pastor talking about different awards and stuff like that, talking about the heart, just, hey, God, I'd like to be like that woman. I mean, if she felt free to give those two mites in, you know, I'd kind of like that freedom too. So as we give our tithes and our offerings, they fund the church, they do various things, but also it's an opportunity to connect with God and to be in that source of life that he is in. So God, I just want to thank you so much for what you're doing here. I want to thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. God, I want to thank you that we can be secure in that salvation. But in that salvation, we can be in you and we can rest in you and we can be free. In your son's name. Amen. Well, the host now will pass the offering buckets. And while
while they're doing that, as you've heard, next Sunday is Mother's Day. Um, was doing a little bit of reading on Mother's Day, and it started out with basically, you know, some uh, people just wanting to honor their mother for various reasons. And the idea caught on, and now we have an actual Mother's Day, which is a great thing. So in that, you know, talk to your mother. Um, unfortunately, my mother is now in heaven. I mean, fortunately, she's there now. Unfortunate for me, it's a little hard to talk to her now. But uh, uh, great mother, respected her, did many things for her kids as well as my father. Now, at the end of the service here, um, what we're going to have is we're going to have a meet and greet, um, especially uh, for people here that are visiting. Maybe you've never met the leadership. I mean, you've seen Pastor Lon here. You've, you've seen Jamie here, you know, lead worship and all. But you would like to actually meet them and to, uh, you know, kind of get to know them a little bit. They're already in the back right now uh, near the back doors. So, uh, you know, please feel free to do that. Also, we have a Connection Cafe over there. If you would just like to sit down and, and snack on something and just, you know, get to know other people, that's a great way to do it. And also, too, we had some prayer earlier, but there is a prayer team, and they're actually coming out right now. And so they will be happy to pray for you. If you have any prayer concern, it can be health, it can be relational situations, it can be uh, circumstances, it could be uh, maybe, you know, you lost your job, whatever, or, you know, it could be just, uh, you know, concerns about somebody else. No concern is too small. So come, come. They're here for you. They are here for you. And then Mother's Day next Sunday, we get to hear PJ, as we call her on the music team, Pastor Joanne. And so, uh, you know, she always does a wonderful job. And uh, so we'll be all looking forward to that. So God bless you in the blessings of the Lord and have a great day.